Good afternoon, everyone. We're just going to give a couple minutes. I know some people are still entering, so just a minute or two. Hi, welcome. Going to give it a couple more seconds just because I see the participant numbers climbing. So I just want it to kind of level off and let everyone come in. Talia, can you add Rachel uh, as a, a presenter? Yes, I will do that now. She's on the call, but she didn't know how to get it okay. added to that. Perfect. Okay, in the interest of time, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everyone to the February uh, UTASP NCSD uh, NIPS call and our first call of 2022. We're so glad to start off um, the series again this year with you all. Next slide, please. So to start off um, the year, we thought we would take it all the way back uh, to the beginning. We know that some people have joined us, a lot has changed. So we're gonna do a back to basics presentation today. And it'll be an overview of confidentiality and privacy concerns. So we'll be discussing that. And we have two fabulous presenters uh, today. So first we'll hear from Frank Strona, who is um, the head of UTASP, our work group technical, um, assistance manager here at CDC. Um, and then we will also hear from the field and Steve Beagle, who is a field coordinator at the University of North Carolina and North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services. So I will turn it over to Frank. Good afternoon, everybody. Please pardon my uh, voice. I have a bit of a, a, a frog in my throat, so to speak. So I will try to make sure I speak loud enough. Today, we're gonna be doing somewhat of a overview uh, and what we call our back to basics. We know many of the programs uh, with um, a COVID rolling out kind of stopped some of their internet related stuff for, for STI and HIV and have been rethinking how they want to do things, especially in light of COVID uh, and contact tracing. So we thought this would be a great idea to just remind folks where we come from, what the element of, and uh, uh, you'll be able to kind of see some inspiration on where you want to take it. And then Steve will give you some other um, tips, tips and techniques. But if you are a program uh, that would like to have us follow up with you and come up with a plan on how to get you more technical assistance, you can reach out uh, to me direct uh, when you get the survey at the end of the call. From, from our partners at NCSD, just uh, add your, your program uh, and your email address and they will show, share that with me or send me an email directly and uh, we will follow up. So on that note, let's just jump right in because I don't know how long the voice will last. I also have Rachel Kotcher from UTAPS on, online in case I my voice fades out and she's gonna jump in. So if you hear us change, that's what's happening. All right, next slide, please. So why, really, why are we, why do we even want to do a back to basics? Well, it was really to remind folks that, you know, sex on the internet isn't new. Sex that we, people have been having sex in public spaces for years. As a matter of fact, since the 1950s that we can record in terms of public health issues. But the internet and technology brought a whole new world of this. So it was really just a reminder of some of the language, um, are you prepared to do this? And to set the context that really internet and applications are just another venue. And if you're trained in one venue, you're gonna be confident. You can learn some, the skills to transfer that to this venue, the technology venue. Next slide, please. So the question also, uh, well, uh, I think it's uh, one behind there, thanks. Uh, one of the questions that comes up is why do we even want to come up with this specific uh, training such as this on these non-traditional spaces? Well, really, it's because we it's always important to know that 
while the online venue is one place on many of our populations meet people, so does com public and commercial sex environments. They will continue to exist. And we know that now post uh, the first 18 months of COVID, uh, many places have begun to loosen their restrictions. We know a lot of sex parties are beginning. Some of the commercial um, venues are opening up now. So uh, bath, bath houses, places like that. So you have to, we wanna make sure we don't lose track in all of the push forward of what's happened in the past that brought us here. It also is to understand that there's a different kind of cultural insight that's important to understand about um, the men who you frequent these places. And while I say men today, it, it, it could happen in the future that they be women, that they be youth. Right now, most of our, our uh, concern has really focused on gay, bi, and other men who have sex with men. But it's not to say that um, after two years of living online, we won't see potential risk and clusters now showing up in youth, uh, adolescent, and heterosexual communities. Also, I always want to remind people that we want to make sure we're distinguishing between an, the, the activity that puts somebody at risk and not the venue itself as well as understanding there's a level of cultural sensitivity to be to appreciate with this kind of work. Next slide, please. So let's just do a little history. Next slide. Why do these venues continue to attract? Well, first of all, it's not just a gay thing. Many, many people are using all of the all of the online venues. We know that whether it be sex parties or public sex venues, um, bookstores, and now online applications or web-based tools, people gravitate. Sometimes it's because they lack mentors and, and sexual, an opportunity to explore. Um, sometimes there's limitations in the traditions that people have if you're coming out or more, may, they may live or operate in more restrictive communities. For many years, especially in regard to HIV, there was this issue, this myth that these venues actually increase risk. And as early as 2003, we saw articles that actually said that's not the case, that we were finding many less um, cases of risk, that it was more likely to happen in, the, in your own room uh, between uh, consenting adults privately. Um, so, you know, it's really to, to understand that we have to think broadly when we, we go this route. Next slide. Who uses the venues? Well, there are a lot of different types when we, when we speak of gay and bi and other and men who have sex with men as well, I'm gonna focus on, but they seem to fall, fall into these categories. There's the person who has is very sexually liberated. They, they look and they choose to operate um, in this place. Um, they wanna go to any kind of venue that will gravitate to them, that will uh, facilitate making a hookup quicker, whether it's the bookstore, using online, sometimes all of the above. It's not unusual for men who are at the bathhouses to also be online uh, at, on Grindr or Scruff at the same time. Um, there's, you know, so then there's, you have these, the out or self-identified uh, gay, gay men. We have transitioning people. And when I say transitioning, it's not just trans men. It's also folks who are beginning a transition from questioning to understanding if they are gay or bi. Um, there's sometimes in these venues the also the you know he is but he isn't uh, guy. This is this is the one who is somewhat closeted, but he's making use of these venues as a way to entertain partners. We have bisexual men and sexually convenient men. This is a, a, a different group. The sexually convenient men are someone who uh, is someone who has somewhat of a fluidness to when they're looking to get off. And while they may exist and, and operate as heterosexual men, um, given drugs, alcohol, or just over desire, will go where they can take care of business. And then, of course, uh, new and questioning male. I say male here or men, uh, and I'm using that broadly speaking, it's any self-identified um, person that is identifying as gay or bi or male. The whys, very common. Some of it's for the, some of it's it's a thrill. It's a high. Sometimes they it, these venues allow some level of anonymity. Um, you can find partners who that you you can filter and get to people who want the same thing sufficiently. Um, you can explore different types of sex and sexuality. And sometimes it's a way to just avoid any norm uh, social norms that you may or may not prescribe to. Next slide. It's important to keep in mind um, that when we say the LGBT community, that's not really one community. Same thing as gay men are not one community. 
Um, it's important to understand that even within this spectrum that there are uh, networks, that there are groups. Um, so when developing any kind of publicity or promotion, uh, just remember that the image you choose may not appeal to everybody. So if you're, uh, the, the people in your risk group, let's say um, if you happen to be in a location where the men that you're trying to outreach because of your demographics are in their 50s, then it may not necessarily be a youth or a young looking male whose image is the most effective. But you know, as you can see, there's a lot of self-identified niches and networks that people um, uh, participate in. So it's important when you're looking at language, looking at promotion, looking at communications that you understand that it doesn't really work to do one fit all. Um, not everybody sees himself as part of a community. So you, it, it's it's many now the latest language is that they're parts of networks or tribes. Um, you may have to be careful in the way you're phrasing that when you you're doing partner services, even in person. Um, if you if you are approaching that that um, script of, but it's good for the community. You want to then say, it's, you know, it may be that it's better for the men that you associate with, because community is very wide. Um, and please be careful. We, you know, the word the term MSM is what we use for in, in the clinics, it, it's what we use at the CDC, but the community themselves do not recognize that term. That is not a term that they understand. So, if, you know, we've had recently where somebody was promoting a, an online group and th they didn't quite realize they couldn't, they weren't recruiting anybody. MSN is not a language of, of the folks in, in who are parts of this. Next slide, please. So there are three types of venues I just wanted to, uh, I think if you go to the next slide, I thought the animations were turned off. So there are three types of venues. We've got our public venues, right? These are bulk stores, rest stops, public bathrooms, recreational facilities. These are generally free. They don't require a membership. Um, you can go in, they're often subject to law enforcement um, concerns, and they will often um, conflict with local rules and operating. These are the ones where your traditional outreach team have been able to go uh, if you're, you have a good outreach group, but they're also where DIS who've met people would go. Yeah, that's good. Let's go to the second one. I'm ready. The professional venues, and uh, just keep hitting return. I think this one, I thought I turned these animations off. Um, the professional venues, these are where people, ultimately you're paying a membership fee to participate or um, some kind of access. Everybody has a different level of rules, but generally there's some kind of access requirement. Uh, some people are taking um, uh, some people are taking uh, IDs. They have to agree to uh, any kind of uh, behaviors, etc. Et These fall into a gray area a lot of times. Some of them are legally operating as sex venues. Some of them are very gray and loosely defined, um, but. They are also, these are, these are actually as businesses can be incredible partners to partner with in your programs where you are, if you leverage them as partners and not vict uh, uh, villains, which we found, I know my work in San Francisco and several other cities, the minute you reached out to some of these owners of these places, they were more than happy to have conversations as long as um, they, they, were, they were approached as a partner. Next slide. And then, of course, now the third one is our technology-based venues. Now, there we usually have, right now, this will change every minute, but we've got three types. There was the old-school web-based membership. So these are the, you know, the original man hunts, the original web, uh, website-based ones where you it exists solely online. Their membership was online. There's still quite a few of them. There's Then they, they rolled out the smart device crew. And the smart device ones were down, they were meant for tablets and phones. And then more recently, you're seeing a hybrid. And these are fully functioning app and websites. Their databases are combined, but they're making it accessible to, to the person from either, um, either angle. The challenge is smart device applications that we will, for instance, like a grinder, you can't always use the internet to get to them. You have to have it downloaded on your phone or your tablet. Sex seeking online is not new. You know, the history goes back thousands and thousands of years. Um, this is one of our favorite slides. Rachel and I both like to geek out around uh, history. And Pompeii, in fact, 
um, this is that first image, they would have sex commercial sex venues that uh, participants would go. And since the majority of people didn't know how to read, they would have pictures depicting exactly what um, you would point uh, and what you wanted to you know, have and sort of very much like, um, you know, going to a restaurant where you're just pointing at the food. What we did find more recently about four years ago that this second image with the couple, it's a well, well known couple. Um, it originally, it was called the lovers. What they've now found under more scientific uh, review is it's not a male and a female, it's two men. It's just to remind you that what you see doesn't always, isn't always what's reality. But the reality is sex seeking has been going on for generations. For those of you who are new to the field, and we know that DIS rotate, um, you take advancement, that most of my experience with folks who work in, as disease investigators, you get some of the best training and experience, and that other sections of the health departments are always trying to steal you away. But so it's great because we get to welcome new, new folks to the community of, of our professionalism. Um, but it's just, just to give you context, that um, we saw, you know, we, we started with the WAN ads and, and we've had WAN ads in some kind or personal ads since the, uh, 1695, some of the first examples of bachelors looking for women and wives. Um, we see in the 1700s, we actually see the beginnings of gay men using these, um, mostly as a way of communicating personal safety. There would be ads coming out saying where it would be safe or where they had just raided. It wasn't until we hit around, um, you know, 1800s, 1900s, we actually see everybody beginning to think of these as a tool. The telephone lines, we really hit the mainstream world with telephone and chat rooms in the 90s and into 2000s. Matter of fact, 1999, for some of you old school folks, um, Gaydar was the first launch of one of the first websites, uh, internet based for gay and bi men, and Grindr kicked off in 2009. So for those of you who've been in the field a while, that kind of gives you a, a real context that how long Grindr has been around. This is also a huge billion dollar industry, these dating and, and social apps, just to keep that in mind. Next slide, please. As I said, it's not just MSM and gay and bi men. There are growing apps now that are appearing for uh, adolescents, for women, for people who want to have affairs. My favorite is this newest one in the lower left-hand image with the VR goggles. Um, there, you know, this, this idea of virtual reality sex is looping around every several years and a new thread of it is coming out. You also have swingers as well as uh, the, the progressive sex communities, which is leather, kink, and, and, and fetish-based. Next slide. So some context, just to give you a quick timeline of where we are, you know, in the 70s or 60s, we had, it was very much about place. If, if you know any DIS who worked in the 60s, you know, they will tell you stories. It was a lot of venue-based activity. Um, it, uh, you would go to these venues. In the 70s, culture and social networks started to push boundaries, substance use shifted. Um, there was uh, more freedoms to kind of be your own way, be your own thing, socialize, networkings were beginning to really form. But it wasn't until the 80s that we saw growth in high tech. Um, you know, back in the 80s, a personal computer was a half the size of the desk. Fast forward today, it's the size you can carry in your pocket. But we saw then, you know, by the 90s, this is all overlaid with HIV increased STDs, um, more folks coming out feeling safer. We also had some shifts in medications. So at the same time, HIV was really prevalent. We also had new uh, body images were beginning to shift. People were beginning to understand the normalization of being HIV positive and being sexual. The medications were feeling, giving them more of a sense of identity that they are healthy and, and have a sexual sense of pleasure. And of course, it's now the generation of BYOD. Bring your own device. Um, you know, you can literally be logged into multiple devices at the same time. And by the time you get home or make a stop after work. Um, so we also, they're more men, they're less identity focused. We're seeing that with young, um, uh, young men these days, they're less uh, interested in even being labeled gay or bi. They're just who they are and they're picking and choosing who their partners are on a variety of things. And then, of course, there's all of our biomedical prep, PEP, viral load uh, awareness, et cetera. 
For those of you who are visual, this is essentially the same thing I just said, but to give the visual learners in the room uh, a, an interesting visual, this is the same thing. Equipment costs went down, email access became super easy, service access became easy, barriers of fear of being caught lessened, and portability and convenience increased. When you put all that together, everything shifted. Next slide, please. So why does this continue to be a, a, attractive? Well, there's two areas that we look at. From a structural pers perspective, it's quicker. Let's face it, it's quick, it's convenient. In some ways, it's the today's version of uh, you know going to a superstar. And for those of you who are younger than me, superstar was a, a place you would go to rent DVDs as I age myself. But it's quick, it's convenient. You can dial up what you like and you know within minutes to an hour, you may find something. Um, our equipment costs, now more and more people can buy burner phones, uh, uh, you know, gen the second or first generation iPhones, um, Android phones. The equipment itself, you don't need to have a computer to do all this. As I said, email access, you know, there are so many ways to what perceives to be anonymous email, although it often isn't, and portability. But on a personal perspective, you know, we're, they, these it is it appeals to folks because it can help reduce the feelings of isolation. And we know that um, with two years of COVID, many people were online socializing, uh, sexualizing online. There were a lot of sex dates, regular dates that people were meeting because they they were by and large trying to isolate and to fall within the standard, and they turned back to the social mechanisms of the internet. For folks who need more anonymous anonymity or reducing their fear, that could be a real incentive to using these. Um, it's also a level of, of uh, personas. It gives you these tools. You know, um, a, a web app allows you to create basically a marketing platform that you promote. You know, it's who you want to be in that moment. So you could see th the same person on three different apps, and they might have three different personalities depending on the content of the app. It allows for specialty niches. So you have um, apps that are very specific for condom-free sex or for kinks or for based on um, age, for instance, or other interests. Some say they can be addictive. The, you know, the, um, the science on that is conflicting, but I put it up here just to say that when, you, uh, when you're moving forward, that it's, it's definitely um, something to consider. I'm not going to read all these up. This is just a reminder um, that we have, but basically this is a lot of what you know. Next slide, please. So why do we want to consider um, using tech for partner services? We have an, eth an ethical responsibility to try. We know that we can meet populations where they are. We know that where there's technology, there's sex. So if we have this as a tool, will this replace traditional partner services? It should not. The people who do this the best are the people who are have a strong background in the tradition, traditional basics of partner services. This is just one more tool in the toolkit for kind of an overused um, level of word. Um, next slide, please. Some I just got a bunch of slides here. We're going to go through pretty quickly because I want to leave enough time for Steve as well. Um, you know, the, the online community, it's it's complex. They're marketing tools, profiles are marketing tools to get something, a date, a friend, a sex. Um, if you're going to use these apps, make sure you check out the terms of services, all of FAQs, understand the nuances. Like in some apps, if you log in and you look at somebody's profile, they can in fact see you've looked at them. Um, the names will often give you a pretty clear indication. And remember, anonymous doesn't mean anonymous, and I'm sure Steve will kind of give you a great example of that. Um, next slide. Let's let's go the next slide. Next slide there. Um, one of the things that we can understand is that these are different ways of approaching the conversation. If you have a good conversation um, a lexicon that you're familiar with, some of these words will come in handy as a DIS. Then you're going to illustrate that you have an awareness of who you are, and who people are that you're working with. Next slide. 
Limitations of the apps is acronyms and lexicons is often a problem. So for instance, if you put language, a lot of the apps now will flag different combinations. So if you put capital T, part PMP, Coke, party, they actually will flag that account, flag that account and no longer allow that. So that's in, in much um, to support the work of building healthy online communities and the work they've done with owners to really try to get app owners to really take more of a responsibility um, from that perspective. Next slide. Um, go ahead, we're gonna skip the, the next two slides. Those are just some vocabulary words. We can share this later on. So if your program, next slide, if your program is really thinking about wanting to do, you do have to do a little homework. You wanna understand that you have to be comfortable as many DIS are on explicit language. Um, visuals. It's going to be a little different than somebody just telling you what they do if you actually see pictures in their profile. So make sure that you're comfortable with that. Next slide. Um, there are challenges for us to do internet partner services, keeping in mind that, you know, we may be uncomfortable. We have to understand our cultural worldview may be different than our patients. Understanding that our privilege when we drop in we have a sense of power when we're saying we have a, a public health issue to discuss with you. Um, just keep in mind that, you know, it's not the panacea, it's not a perfect tool and understanding your place in the process is incredibly important um, for success. Next slide. Uh, if you've been on any of our calls, you know, we have a website that has all of our basics that you can pull from. All of the content on this, uh, the website is available in our toolkit. Take it, use it, adapt it. You can reach out to us. Next slide. Um, uh, you can always reach out to us uh, to schedule a call. Um, if you aren't already, please sign up for the webinar and the listserv. That's how you find out what we're doing with NCSD, as well as um, very few announcements. We generally don't use it more than several times a year. You can go to the next two slides then. And then uh, we are getting ready and we're very excited. If you haven't done the app simulator, we just updated it all and we're getting ready to roll out um, three new modules in the next few months. But this is a great practice tool for folks who have new DIS. If you're thinking about using IPS um, in, your, in your programs, this simulates some of the elements of internet partner services, and it gives you, a, it's like a 20 or 30 minute sampler, you can do it online, you can do it on your phone for new staff as a way to familiarize yourself with them. And that's it. Two minutes to spare. Uh, this, my email is the uh, last slide. If you don't have it, I'll put it in, while Steve is talking, I'll also put it in the chat box. And we'll save questions till the end. Excellent, Frank. I really like uh, the, the historical images. Uh, next slide, please. So here's a disclosure. This is basically saying that uh, there's no relationship between me, um, any of the symbols and logos, trademarks I'm gonna show you uh, between me at the UNC and NCDHHS. Next slide, please. So uh, the state of North Carolina and our DIS, I uh, want to give a shout out to DIS in North Carolina and DIS everywhere who have had to adjust the way they do their job um, to do, to continue contact tracing, to continue pri providing partner services over the last couple of years. And uh, in North Carolina, we have uh, about seven regions of state North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services, DIS. Um, the first region is in Asheville, North Carolina, the western part of the state, beautiful, um, very rural in a lot of the state, uh, mountainous, um, Appalachian, Appalachian, Appalachian State University is out there. Region two is our Charlotte office, and Charlotte is the most populated city in the state. UNC Charlotte is in Charlotte. Uh, region three is in Greensboro, North Carolina. And I should mention that uh, Mecklenburg County and Wake County and Pitt County across the state also have county DIS as well as Cumberland County. So region three is Greensboro, North Carolina. That's the Piedmont region of the state. 
The triad, as they call it, is Greensboro, Winston-Salem, and High Point. Region four is where Raleigh, the state capital is. And that's where I spent my time as a DIS in the field from 2000 to 2017. And we have uh, UNC, Duke, NC State, Wake Forest is actually in region three, and NC Central in region four in terms of academic colleges, universities. Region five is in Cumberland County. Fort Bragg Army Base is there. That's the Sand Hills part of the state. Region six is in Eastern North Carolina, very rural and country. And uh, in Winterville, it's right next to a tiny city, right next to Greenville, where East Carolina University is and where our regional office used to be. And region seven is in Wilmington, North Carolina. UNCW is there, and that's where a lot of aspiring marine biologists go uh, to study marine biology. And that is the beach. And that is one of the most coveted places in North Carolina. Next slide, please. So my title is field coordinator. And since I've been out of the field since 2017, basically have two jobs two main tasks. And the first one is to assist DIS across the state with identifying their contacts, figuring out what their actual legal name is, um, and also to help them locate people. So what we used to call marginal information because of technology is very different now. So very commonly, if we have a first name and a phone number, partial address, age, physical description of someone, city of residence, we can often find out their actual identity. Whereas in the past, we just would have had to say they were marginal. So when DIS are doing partner services interviews and a uh, person they're interviewing gives them only a Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, or grinder username or an email address for a contact for a partner, they'll forward that information to me in the form of a task to assist them in identifying that person so that we can offer them uh, services. And the reason that they have me do that task is I, I just found out that at the state, uh, they keep emails for 10 years. So it's just easier for the state of North Carolina to have someone at an academic institution or if I were at a community-based organization to uh, jump over the technology hurdles and the confidentiality and the responsibility um, versus uh, making sure that DIS statewide can do this on their devices, their computers and their work cell phones. So the second thing I do is help DIS and state bridge counselors. Those are the Lincoln case managers in North Carolina for HIV care. Um, I help them locate people when the traditional means have fallen short. So, or have not worked. Um, these are people who've been exposed, uh, people who have not been post-test counseled after testing positive for syphilis or HIV, um, people who require treatment, and people who we would like to offer partner services interviews. Um, for the state bridge counselors, the Lincoln case managers, uh, there are times when they don't appear that they've been in care in North Carolina. Um, no labs in over six months or a year. So we don't know if they're at, in care in a different state or if they just aren't in care right now and we wanna offer them a, a way to get back into care. So I will help bridge counselors uh, get in touch with those folks as well. Uh, DIS statewide are able to text clients. Unfortunately, they're not able to email or use social media and dating and sex seeking apps to reach out to their clients. Sorry, uh, the people that we serve. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna walk you through the way I was trained back in 2000, the year 2000, and what I still do to this day, um, it's changed a little bit now that I'm strictly 
uh, technology based. Um, so the first thing I do is I was told to look in the closed greens when I first became a DIS for a record of that person if they have a history of syphilis or HIV. Because if you can find a history and figure out a reason why they do not need to be contacted or followed up on at this point in time, you've saved a lot of time right there in that moment and can move on to someone who does need services. So I look right under my nose in our own STI management system. Ours is our adapted version of Maven. You might have Prism. I don't know if anyone still has STD MIS, what have you. What I like about this is the folks had me in mind and North Carolina in mind when they have uh, places for us to add the internet screen name and also the uh, event-based email address. And we can look folks up and find them that way. So that if my memory is not serving me right and a new username comes up on a case for a contact, I can search that and I won't have to uh, spend a lot of time figuring out who that person is. Next slide. So, uh, what I used to do, I wouldn't check the jail until when I was in the field until it was one of the last things to do. Uh, maybe I've been making phone calls and field visits and hadn't heard from the person I was looking for and probably won't find them. So let's go to the H list, unable to locate and let's see if they're in jail. And now when DIS send me tasks to help them try and figure out where someone is. That's the first place I check. And it's also the last place I checked before I decide I, I can't find them or at this point in time, or um, here they are, they actually just showed up in jail. So, because most, I mean, most people are not gonna have access to a phone in jail or the internet or their apps. There's, there's no point in messaging people unless you want them to see that message when they get released. Uh, to call the DIS. Next slide. So, um, you know, keeping with that, uh, we check prison, prison history, probation, parole, um, prison, uh, excuse me, probation officers are not required in North Carolina to assist us or help us get in touch with someone, but some of them do. So it's worth a shot. And uh, especially in the rural parts of the state, DIS will contact someone's probation or parole officer and say, can you give them my number? Can I leave a referral with you? Can, where do you think they are right now? What's, what number do you have for them? And some of them do help and it's worth a shot. Next slide, please. So um, I don't know if y'all take it for granted, but I certainly do not back in when I first started as a DIS, the only time I think we would have pictures of people would be if there's a driver's license and a medical record, a copy of it, or if we're looking for a contact, if the, the person we were interviewing showed us a photo of them, that's the only time we'd really have a photo of them. I think a, a, a visual identification is very good for confidentiality. Um, and so along with that, uh, not just one Facebook profile these days, but people have multiple. It's almost like you can see them getting displaced and then being around a computer or a phone for a while, getting another profile, a couple months, or maybe they'll have two profiles at once for different reasons. Um, there's information to be gleaned off of each one of those profiles. Maybe their friends are private on one profile and maybe their family's private on one profile. But on another profile, they might say who their mother is. They might have their friend's profile, their uh, public. Um, even me, I'm an example of that. Um, my iPhone 6 and my iPhone 7, I tried to repair the battery myself, almost burnt the house down. And so I'd be without my phone for less than 24 hours. And uh, I would have to start a new profile because I didn't write any passwords down so I wouldn't get hacked and um, or someone steal my passwords. So I'd have to start up a new profile. 
Um, so it happens with me as well. And now that Facebook has acquired Instagram, we can actually message Instagram profiles from Facebook Messenger, which is great because Instagram had some kind of filter where whenever I would send my messaging templates for people to contact EIS, they were able to immediately jump on that and say, we can't send these messages to people. You should try to do a business profile. So that cut, that shut me down on Instagram. But now that I know I can message, send that same message to an Instagram profile through Messenger, um, I'm back on my feet for that. Next slide, please. So my favorite thing I found out in 2006 about Accurate. And it blew my mind that public health agencies could access the same database for phone numbers and addresses on people um, that law enforcement could. So I spent This is Rachel. I feel like I lost sound as well. I don't know if others um, did as well, Talia, or if it's it, maybe yeah. Steve. We lost I Steve. I did too. Um, hold on, everyone. Just give us a minute. We'll see if Steve is able to regain. Hey, can you hear me, folks? Yes. yes. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, computer didn't do what I wanted it to and cut out. Okay. So anyway, um, when I finally got access to Accurate myself in 2017, um, jumped on Accurate, and I've just been obsessed with it ever since. Um, I know that there's other uh, sites like that that cost, ah, there we go, TLO is more accurate. I was, was going to ask um, Clear. I feel like Accurate is better than Clear. TLO was a, I was told was actually made by whoever made Accurate. And so uh, hopefully we have audio now. So, okay, good. At least showing audio on my side. So um, uh, I would love to hear about your experiences with clear TLO or if there's something else out there. So, um, next slide, please. So um, believe it or not, uh, I used to just kind of shake my nose at the free sites that are out there, Fast People Search and True People Search. There are times when I look inaccurate to say I have a first name of someone and a phone number and uh, accurate will not have any information on that phone number. So I will look into fast people search or true people search and cross direct that phone number. And that person will show up um, in that database. So then I take their information and old phone number and address from that information. And I put that into accurate, then I can identify them. Um, that has happened on a couple occasions and been very helpful. Uh, next slide, please. So there are times when DI, I'll see that DIS are going out to an address and they'll say this address doesn't exist. Um, let's, let's make sure that's true. And you can look that up on USPS.com and it'll tell you if the address exists or not. Um, since we're a state agency, we're very county-based and uh, jurisdictions are very county-based. So, um, even though an address might be in a city that is mainly one county, occasionally part of that city will overlay into another county. USPS.com will show you which county that address is in. Next slide, please. So um, the last thing I'll do is I'll throw a phone number or a username through Google and I'll put it in quotes if it's a username. Um, phone numbers aren't working too much anymore. I wonder if that's Facebook's fault, privacy, that kind of thing. But uh, I'll show an example of where putting a username in quotes and searching it on Google actually helped to identify and locate someone. And there's, I use about two of the search tricks in this article. There's seven of them. They say that everyone should know. 
I just use quotes and I use the plus sign sometimes, but there's some other ones um, that are that can help us identify and locate people. Next slide. So very commonly I'll get, after I go through all of those steps and I check Google and I don't have anything, and let's say I have a first name and a phone number. Um, first thing I'll do after that is put it into WhatsApp. And let's say we enter my phone number, my work phone number into WhatsApp. We save it as a contact. We don't even name it or anything. We just wanna see if it's in WhatsApp, if it's linked to an account. And we check to see if it's linked to a phone number. So if you were to put my work phone number into WhatsApp, you would see that little profile to the right. So it'd be my photo that I have everywhere, my only dressed up photo. And uh, that would show you what I look like or what photo I put in that profile. Um, and it can give you an, a clue as to the identity of the person that you're looking for. Next slide. So there's a what we call a trick, but uh, it's mainly for um, uh, just helping us to further identify and locate someone. It's mainly for finding your friends or your coworkers on another platform. Um, if you were to put my work number in your phone contacts, let's just save it as something put all the letters in the first name field of your contacts, just something that all runs together, Steve Beagle NC. If you're to initial, excuse me, enable Snapchat, Cash App, TikTok to access your contacts, uh, you could shortly after, if it doesn't happen immediately, check back 24, 48 hours. You should be able to see those profiles there below on Snapchat, Cash App, and TikTok. It works a little bit for Instagram, um, not very fast, not very often in my experience. And people are still using Kick to this day. I thought we were done with that app, but it's still around in North Carolina. It takes weeks usually on Kick for it to work. Next slide, please. So um, here's a recent example. I, I think I've heard of this site before, FetLife.com. Um, but had never come across my desk in the field. And this is the first time a few weeks ago that this happened. Uh, I changed the identifier for this example, of course, for confidentiality. We were given something like Cali Boo 91. Uh, we we're told she was 30, given a description, city of residence. I know that I have a better chance of locating and providing services through a DIS to someone by identifying them and letting them find them traditionally with phone calls, text messages, and field visits than I would just telling Callie Boo that she may have been exposed through the site because I'd never been on there before. And if I did that, I might get kicked off immediately. It might be uh, flagged as a scam. So, um, I decided to try and figure out who Cali Boo was. It kind of looked like a unique username, but not too unique. So I Googled it in quotes. It brought up a Pinterest and a Twitter link for someone named Cali Green. And I couldn't tell if she matched in those profiles to the FetLife profile that we had visually. So I checked Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter, found a possible match. Um, it looked like someone had tagged her years ago in a Twitter post, um, but they may have spelled her uh, Twitter handle a little bit different. Maybe they said Caliboo 1991 instead of Caliboo 91. But when she tried to tag her, she mentioned a, a festival that is that I know is to be local, the theme of it, to the city of residence for Caliboo. So I put that Cali Green that came up from Google onto Maven. I uh, use the filter, the parameters, female, and I'm pretty sure she was probably born in 1991 because of her age and her username. So we look for the whole year of 1991 and put her city of residence into Maven. There was a Callie Green who had chlamydia in 2016. So I put uh, the demographic information we had in Maven into Accurate and also put that into 
let's see, Facebook. And I found a visual match. Um, she mentioned that she was the spouse of her uh, husband on FetLife. So I saw a picture of him on FetLife. And of course, um, from there, we see on her Facebook profile, a photo of her to match up to the FetLife profile. And her husband was always also on uh, her Facebook profile. So we had double confirmation. So um, I think I'm out of time, have a lot more information, but I'm definitely open to some questions at this point. Great. Thank you so much, Steve and uh, Frank. Um, so it looks like we had a question in the chat, but Megan, thank you for responding. Does anybody else have any questions for either of our speakers? If not, Steve, if you want to keep going for another three or four minutes, you're welcome to if you want to finish out your slides. Okay, great. Um, so uh, since that was the first time that FetLife came up in the field, um, I had to go and create a profile just so I could at least verify that Caliboo's username existed and uh, hopefully, you know, like adult um friend finder years ago it gave people the option to actually put their date of birth on the website and believe it or not folks will put that out there so i uh, created the profile and to me it looks just like a facebook profile except everything's got a black background and the focus is on fetishes as opposed to just uh, what facebook is these days next slide so if I can't identify someone based on their username, email, um, what I'll do is uh, do the messaging that the DIS and the state bridge counselors are not permitted to do. Or even uh, I might go ahead and text them because my text message looks different than the one that they send to people when they're trying to get in touch with them. These are very similar or contained in um, the uh, tool the uh, toolbox for partner services. And um, so basically I just send a message that says, please call the DIS, excuse me, toolkit is the word I was looking for. Um, I'll send a message that says, please contact the DIS. If you wanna verify that this profile is uh, legitimate, you can call our supervisor. And the next message I send, if we don't get a response is, I just change the title to health matter. And the third one I'll send if they need testing, treatment, or post-test counseling, I'll say if you don't, you know, decide to call the DIS, just go ahead and um, go to your health department or doctor and follow up. I don't say what it's about, um, and we hope that they do go. I don't hear much feedback from that, unfortunately. If we're look, if I'm looking for someone on a sex-seeking site or app will actually come out and say, you may have been exposed to syphilis and or HIV. Please contact the DIS, feel free. Um, and they can schedule an appointment for free testing. If they decide not to contact the DIS and they wanna find out where to get tested near them, they can tap the link gettested.cdc.gov. Um, and the last uh, little message example is for what I send when we're trying to get a, someone to contact a bridge counselor. If you decide not to contact the bridge counselor, just uh, please follow up with your doctor or local health department. Next slide. And actually, so so it looks like you have a few questions. Um, okay. You want to go over the questions. Um, okay. Stephanie asked, if, uh, are you an employee of UNC or NC Health Department, if UNC, how do you get that to work logistically for access to confidential systems and patient information? Right, so um, definitely uh, a memorandum of understanding or agreement between uh, UNC and the North Carolina Department of Health. Um, Got to sign the confidentiality forms, that kind of thing. 
And, uh, you know, UNC, at least in terms of infectious diseases and global health and infectious disease, uh, the doctors that kind of thought this up, the infectious disease practitioners, very progressive and open-minded and actually wanted this to happen, um, just like CDC did. So uh, they stand behind you. They make sure that you, you there's no obstacles in your way. Um, there's nothing wrong with you getting on these sites or these apps with your devices. Uh, and you just, you just kind of go to it. You're supported and uh, we're able to do as much as we can with our devices. Great. And somebody else asked, do you try to contact partners or cases via WhatsApp if you find a profile? Both. Okay. Great. Um, and then somebody also asked, would you suggest having a centralized person to send messages like these or to manage IPS? I can see the benefit for continuity and messaging, but does the volume get overwhelming or is it more timely to have DIS do it directly? Yeah, so um, it does not get overwhelming uh, with one state, believe it or not. Um, I don't even have a backup person anymore. So, I, I mean, I have a lot of work when I come back from vacation, but um, it doesn't get overwhelming, you get busy sometimes. Um, and I definitely, you know, the only thing I don't like about the way it's set up is I'm the middleman and it's kind of like, well, why, why isn't the DIS messaging me or emailing me? Um, this seems shady, you know, that's the only downfall. And maybe in the future we will, um, you know, just kind of pass this off and we'll, we'll train DIS to do this on their own. The other thing is you, you might have too many profiles on a site and then the website gets, or an app, they get privy to that and they say, well, you're violating our terms of service. You can't do this. This is bad for business. And they kick us all off. So you, you just kind of got to decide what you want to do. There are, um, from our work with the different health departments, there are some that have done all different variations of this to different levels of success. Some have trained their uh, you know, they make this like an extra skill set for some of the DIS. Some use all of it. Some have the liaison or the coordinator. I think it's understanding the the program you're in and the people um, that work there and who has the aptitude. Um, there are down, you know, there's a pros and cons. Like Steve just said, there are definitely pros and cons to having a secondary person who's not the one that they're going to talk to. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and in regard to Dakota's just had a question that you should always double check with the legal uh, department what you can and can't say it uh, generally speaking what you can put out in a, in a traditional DIS letter that you mail to somebody you can likely say in an internal message um, but every le every health department has their own set of rules and legal of what how far they could disclose but if your profile when you're building any of these says health department it's already there just as an FYI on, on contacting that. Perfect, thank you so much, Frank. Um, so I just wanna note for everybody, I put a short evaluation in the chat and before we end today, I'm just going to launch this quick poll. Um, if you can tell us what you thought of today's session. Um, but in the interest of time, and if there's no more questions, I think I'm going to close this out, but thank you so much to both Frank and Steve. Um, for taking the time to share with us today and thank you to everyone for attending. Um, like I mentioned in the chat, this session is recorded and it will be posted on our website and sent, we'll send it out through the listserv um, once it's ready to go. But otherwise we look forward to seeing you at our next NIPS call. Um, and thank you both again to our presenters. Oh, and somebody just asked in the chat, can you tell me how often these calls are? Um, we try and have them about every other month. Um, so our next one should be in late spring. Great, thank you so much, everyone. Have a good rest of your afternoon.